This is Josh Barrow, and welcome to Left, Right, and Center, your civilized yet provocative antidote to the self-contained opinion bubbles that dominate political debate. This is a special episode of the podcast we recorded live earlier this week at the Milken Institute's Global Conference in Beverly Hills. And it's about a special topic, freedom, what it is, and who's going to protect it best. We came up with the idea for this session because of an observation we had that the way politicians talk about freedom has changed in recent years. Compared to most conservative politicians, President Trump places less rhetorical emphasis on freedom and liberty, preferring to talk about strength and greatness. The difference flows through to how he talks about policy. While Republicans used to extol the benefits of markets and say the government should not pick winners and losers, Trump prefers to talk about business rather than markets. He's for business and for jobs, but he does not emphasize their organic free nature. In fact, he often praises government intervention in corporate behavior that aims to promote business, jobs, strength, and greatness. As this has happened, some Democrats have become more eager to talk about freedom. Of course, they're not the first. Franklin Roosevelt had his concept of the four freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. The last two of these represent what you might call positive liberties, freedom not from restriction by government, but freedom made possible by having your material needs met. Conservatives have typically said these things are not properly called freedom. They might be good and desirable, but there's something else. And indeed, policies designed to promote freedom from want may end up imposing on people's liberties, for example, through the imposition of taxes. In this discussion, we try to figure out what's the right way to think about freedom, what is it, what are its important parts, and what kind of policy agenda should we have to promote it. In this episode, you will hear from some LRC regulars. On the right, Rich Lowry of National Review and Kenneth Hirsch, president and CEO of the George W. Bush Presidential Center. And on the left, Felicia Wong, president and CEO of the Roosevelt Institute, and Gene Sperling, president of Sperling Economic Advisors and former top economic advisor to Presidents Clinton and Obama. Here's our conversation from the Milken Institute Global Conference. Uh, Felicia, I want to start with you. What is freedom and why does the left have the better understanding of it? Um, Well, thank you, Josh, and I'm glad you started with FDR, uh, because I think that it's no accident that in 1941, when President Roosevelt gave his now canonical for freedom speech, he packaged want and fear with speech and worship. This is for a couple reasons. First of all, you know, in the earlier part of this century, this idea that all of these freedoms were generally part of how we understood freedom, that was just sort of part of the progressive mindset. The idea that there were these negative liberties, of course there's a long political theory history of that, but like that really became popular in the United States in, during the Cold War period, you know, the Isaiah Berlin definition was 1958. Uh, so this idea that want, freedom from want, is just part of what real freedom is, that is part of the American tradition. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing about FDR's uh, inclusion of want in a definition of freedom, he was coming, as we all know, out of the Depression experience. Um, he knew what it meant for American politics and American society when you had 25% unemployment. Um, And he very famously said, necessitous men are not free men. He got that. And for him, freedom from want, this kind of floor, um, was a part of uh, really a plan for stabilizing in a very common sense way. The guy was pragmatic. In a common sense way, he was trying to stabilize the American economy and stabilize American politics. Ken, why isn't that the right way to think about freedom? Well, I don't think there's a right or wrong way to think about freedom. I think people have generally a different perspective on how to deliver the key elements of freedom. I think FDR started with worship and freedom of expression, um, and, then, and then he extended it to what an American definition is to include freedom from want, which I don't, I don't believe that... Um, I think freedom is more basic than that. I think that we have rights as individuals. And while I'm not a pundit, and I don't want to litigate um, what President Trump thinks about freedom or what the Democrats think about freedom, I think that at the Bush Institute and what President Bush defines as freedom is what's deep in everybody's soul is the desire to be free. Based upon that, and that leads down a path of understanding that if you don't support freedom around the world, then tyranny and extremism uh, can, can foment. That's not good for anybody. Free countries and free peoples rarely go to war against other free peoples. And so those are the kinds of basic freedoms. Now when you, when you move from basic freedoms to basic services, how we provide basic services, whether it's food and water and healthcare and sanitation, 
or national defense. Those are things that we as the collective have decided that we're going to, to, uh, to agree to agree on how to deliver it. Now we have a, a really raging debate on how best to deliver it, but I think at the core we're talking about what I believe true conservative values emanate from basic freedoms of expression, worship, the right to, the right to understand and, and to determine your own fate. Those are the elemental levels. In a, and it, very, very important, I think that people, and especially the United States, was formed on the notion that all freedoms, that we retain our freedoms unless we collectively agree to turn them over to a central authority. We don't say they all belong to the central authority unless they're specifically enumerated back to us. And I think that's more basic than, than, than we debate how we provide fr the goods and services. Gene, I, I think sometimes when people on the left think about freedom from want, it, it can be thought of as, as emanating from, from the, the right to pursue happiness, that basically there's no, you know, you can have this suite of, of legal rights and, and negative liberties against government restriction, but if you lack the ba basic resources in your life to do things, they aren't worth a lot to you. And I guess the question is, how do you define a limiting principle there? Because if you say, you know, well, people are entitled to a, to a basic standard of living, that they are entitled to health care, those sorts of things, that, and you say these are elements of freedom, you have to say, well, you know, what, what, what aspects of health care? What is a basic standard of living? Is there a, a limiting principle to what freedom from want is? Because, I mean, you can't literally free people from ever wanting anything that they don't have. How do you decide what sorts of, of aspects of a standard of living are an element of freedom and others that are things that can be just left to the market and people may or may not have them? The reason why I obviously side with the view that FDR first laid out and that Felicia and her organization pursues is that it's not that I believe that the progressive view is all about we're for positive freedoms as opposed to negative freedoms, but asking the question, what does freedom mean in reality to the heart and soul of people as they live their lives? And I've tried to focus some of my work on, on the notion of economic dignity. And, and in a sense that is, uh, gives you some clarity and maybe some limiting principle. Yes, not all of us or few of us are going to get to start for the Detroit Pistons or e even the Golden State Warriors. But, <laughs> there, but there are basic universals that we are capable of providing in terms of the desire to care for your family, to pursue your potential and purpose, to work without a sense of domination and humiliation. And the thing I want to mention is that I think that, that the, the view that Felicia and myself and others pursue does have a heavy dosage of negative protections. It's just that when we look at it, we realize it's not just the government. It's also the market. It's also employers. And it takes into account the reality of es economic desperation and power imbalances. So yes, we do in some sense, you could say, limit the right of a particular employer. You may limit their freedom to do any type of contract that they can uh, muster in a time of economic desperation, whether that leads to uh, quid pro quo sexual favors, whether that leads to sweatshop conditions, whether that leads to kids working. But we decide that for people to be free to pursue their economic dignity, we have to recognize that economic imbalance, that lack of freedom in their lives. And so we put some restrict, we structure the market, not with the goal of limiting the freedom of employers, but with the goal of letting people in their own lives actually pursue the freedom to care for their family without domination and humiliation. So, Rich, I think some of the things that, that Gene lays out there that are in a, in a left view of freedom have made their way into conservative accounts of freedom as well, but in a way that is not always acknowledged by the conservatives making these arguments. I mean, for example, Gene talks about how, you know, it's not just the power of the government we have to worry about, it's power of companies and things like that. You have a lot of conservatives right now complaining, Facebook is censoring me or even more broadly feeling that, that, peop that they are not free because there is a, a dominant culture that doesn't respect them or they feel like they're being told they're not supposed to say things, that's not, a, that's not a, a restriction on liberty from government. It seems to be people feeling toward wanting a certain kind of positive liberty that, it, that, it, that is also in a way related to dignity. They're feeling, you know, I'm not respected. This big, big powerful company that provides a service that I feel I need to use is not providing it on terms that, that, that are respectful of me and that that's making me unfree. So I, I think there, just let me lay out my, 
my basic view and, and get to that. So um, freedom, it, the classic definition and the correct definition is absence from coercion. And um, positive freedom in the sense we're talking about, especially you know, protecting someone's dignity, that's a good, it's a benefit. Um, there may be all sorts of policies that we should pursue to uh, improve people's dignity, but it's not freedom, and it's a distortion of the word freedom uh, to define it as such. And the reason why I think negative freedom is so important is in the broad scheme of things, throughout human history for millennia, the average person subsisted on less than a dollar a day uh, unless you're a part of the warrior caste or a priest or the mem member of royalty until this concept of freedom took hold. And then you saw this incredible uh, takeoff that has basically created the world that, uh, as we know it. Now, I'm not a libertarian, so a libertarian would look at, looks at the state and the individual as the main players and wants the individual to be as free of the state as possible. I'm not obviously sympathetic to that, but I think that's an incomplete account. I'm a conservative, and a conservative views one of the benefits of freedom being this enormous substrata of mediating institutions between the state and the individual, family, church, neighborhoods, civic associations, nonprofits, and that those are things that give our, ultimately give our lives meaning and, and dignity, and they're a function of freedom. And one of the reasons that American civil society throughout our history has been so incredibly robust is because it's been uh, so free. And just the last thing I would say, and this kind of gets to some of the, the ambiguity uh, you're asking about, is freedom is not, uh, uh, freedom is dependent on institutional and cultural constraints. It's not anarchy. It's just not dumping a bunch of people in the, in the desert with no rules. And you can't have freedom as we understand it and experience it unless you have uh, the rule of law, unless you have social trust. And um, uh, without those preconditions, you, you can't have freedom, true freedom. Felicia, what do you make of that? Uh, so I want to point out the difference between liberty and freedom. So the English language is actually the only language where you get to choose. Are you going to talk about liberty or are you going to talk about freedom? Um, and what's interesting is that liberty is much more classically negative. You can be liberated from something, but freedom gives you the option to also have freedom with freedom to and freedom within a larger social or political context. And Hannah Arendt famously talked about this in the late 1950s, about the same time that Isaiah Berlin was you know, trying to distinguish between positive and negative freedoms. But Arendt had a very, very important point, which is that real freedom for her was freedom within a social or political context. And so if you want to be free in a group of people, you must have voice, you must have agency, you must be able to fully participate. Because if not, you're just a subject. Um, and you're a subject either in a kind of monarchical sense or, of course, Arendt was escaping from totalitarianism. So you're a subject in some way where you really cannot uh, in any meaningful way participate. And so I think there's a very rich notion of freedom um, that includes this political realm in addition to um, or in concert with the economic freedoms that FDR laid out. Go ahead, Kat. So I, I, I don't see how increasing government dependency increases freedom. I see how it delivers more basic goods and services according to the current, whatever the current legislative majority is that wants to implement the things that they want to implement. But I've never seen a time where, where people are so willing to turn over their basic delivery of things to something that has a, thir to a body that has a 13% approval rating. And anything that, that, the that, that you rely upon the government for delivery ultimately is going to get politicized. And from that, all sorts of restrictions could happen. Markets aren't perfect, and we can talk about ways to adjust when there are market failures and when there are market inefficiencies, but I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater and end up with less freedom because I've turned over and become more dependent. Less, to me, the, the government ought to focus on doing less things but doing them exceptionally well. As an investor, which is my background, Something that has a really bad track record, the last thing I would do is really go all in. And that to me is the basic, one of the basic problems is I don't know where to go with that. I don't know where to go with the need to rectify some of the answers that Gene really aptly um, outlines 
it, because the body that's, that's answering that question doesn't really have a great track record. So anyway, that's, to me, I think that's, that's one of the cruxes of the issue about, about this debate and about where it ultimately ends up. Well, Gene, I'd like your, your thoughts on that, because I think that also goes to something that Rich mentioned, which Rich was talking about, the, you know, the, essentially the prosperity that has been unleashed by free markets and the freedoms that gives people the prosperity, it, it allows them to do things in their lives they never could have done before. So I think people are sometimes concerned about unintended consequences, that you hand things over to the government and you, you don't know what that does to economic dynamism, and then you don't know basically what, you know, what people are losing that they otherwise would have had. Is that, is that a, a reasonable thing to be concerned about? And, and if you are, how do you balance that against you know, the, the obvious goods that can come from government provision of various things? Look, I don't think any of us would be honest without suggesting that there, you aren't doing certain degrees of balancing here. But again, when I listen to this discussion, I still feel that that what Felicia and I are arguing goes more to how a person experiences freedom from coercion, freedom to live their life, freedom to be part of that prosperity creating machine that we want. I'm gonna give a tangible example right now. Let's look at what the Affordable Care Act does to say that you cannot discriminate against a person because they have a pre-existing condition. So you can't deny a person healthcare benefits uh, or you can't jack up the prices super high because their child has a disability or their spouse has a heart uh, condition. Now you can say, oh my God, that is really restrictive. The government is restricting the ability of what insurance companies can do. But think about it. A person in that situation does not have the freedom to leave a big company and start their own job. They do not have the freedom to move across the country. They are denied freedom in the way that it means the most to them, which is to both pursue their lives and care for their family. So to rely on an abstract view of freedom in that situation, you can, and you might, perhaps you could win some battles with who's most consistent with Hayek or, or, or Friedman if that's your goal. But, it's, but I think you're losing what freedom means in people's life, freedom from coercion. I, of all people, I'm the person who wrote a book called The Pro-Growth Progressive, I believe you do have to make sure that you're doing balances, that you're allowing entrepreneurship and innovation and some of the great things in our country. But I believe a government role in structuring markets, giving people first chances and second chances, can be essential to the reality of giving those people the freedom to pursue their dreams. I think this is such a first world problem. That's an interesting debate to have. There are people who are being locked up in Burma because they post something about a government that's destroying the freedom of expression. People are being locked up all over the world in, you know, for exercising journalistic integrity. I think this is a wonderful debate to have and we should pat ourselves on the back that this is the level of the debate we're having on how best to provide health care because there's a lot of people in this world who are really striving for basic freedoms, basic. And, and it starts with expression and worship and assembly. But I don't understand why that would have to be in opposition with each other. I mean, I don't think anybody on this panel disagrees with the idea that you should not be locked up in Burma for expressing yourself. No, they're not, but, but I'm just saying that, that, that there are notions about delivery, how best to deliver basic services in a developed country, that to me, I think there, these are, these are we're dancing on the head of a pin, essentially, by saying, how can we improve the system? Let's talk about the portability of health benefits. That's great. But I, I think that if we're talking about really a, a notion about what protects human freedoms, I think that's a more basic debate. You're listening to a special episode of Left, Right, and Center recorded live at the Milken Institute Global Conference with Rich Lowry, Kenneth Hirsch, Felicia Wong, and Gene Sperling. More of that conversation is coming up. You're listening to Left, Right, and Center. KCRW sponsors include Netflix, presenting the original documentary, Knock Down the House. Follow the stories of four inspiring women who took on history in the 2018 midterm election. Rolling Stone raves, this film is a look at risking everything to make a difference. Entertainment Weekly challenges, try making it through without getting fully fired up. Winner of the Audience Award and the Festival Favorite Award at Sundance Film Festival. Knock Down the House, streaming now only on Netflix. Hey, it's Josh Barrow, host of Left, Right, and Center. Last year, when President Trump's legal issues became too newsy, too messy, and too interesting not to talk about, we did what any good news organization would do. We called a really good lawyer. And we added a new show, All the President's Lawyers. We're able to do cool stuff like that because of you. Support Left, Right, and Center, All the President's Lawyers, and everything else KCRW does during the Undrive Pledge Drive. 
Go to kcrw.com slash join. And thanks. Rich, I'm interested in the way Republicans have talked about health care over the last 25 years or so, because there, there's definitely language about choice mm-hmm. and the importance of using free markets to bring down costs. But in practice, what you find is that the most popular parts of a law, like the Affordable Care Act, are things that impose restrictions in the market, things like telling insurers that they cannot impose pre-existing condition restrictions, telling them that they must cover your children up to age 26. And when the rubber hits the road with Republicans putting out health care policies, they don't seem to go toward that choice angle. They don't, you know, people do not want high deductible plans where they go and shop around a lot uh, for the kinds of coverage that they're getting. So has, have Republicans given up on the idea of freedom in health care? And, and have they done that for a good reason because there doesn't seem to be public demand for freedom? Well, I, I think the, um, the debate over whether we're going to have some significant involvement in our health care system sailed long ago for better or worse. So what we're talking about with these Republican plans usually is plans that concede a significant government role but try to find uh, a less coercive means and uh, that, that does give people more choices uh, than they have now or they have in the democratic alternatives. But if we just go sort of to, the, uh, to the, one of the extremes of this debate, like the Bernie Sanders uh, Medicare for All plan, I just don't see how there's any way you can possibly define a plan that would take away people's private insurance and prevent them from buying voluntarily private insurance that's on offer and that people want to sell them, how you can possibly define that as freedom. That is completely perverse. And I think the the healthcare system, education, and housing are three areas where we see the typical dynamic in a market not at work, which is usually the market provides us more and better goods at a lower cost. The opposite dynamic is uh, at hold in all these things, partly because government restricts the supply at the same time it subsidizes demand. And so, Felicia, what, what Rich says there about single-payer and freedom, I think this is borne out in public polling, which is to say when you ask people about single-payer, their approval varies widely depending how you ask the question. When you tell people that it would mean the end of private insurance, you lose 20 points of public opinion approval on the idea of single-payer. Isn't the public attached to certain ideas about choice and freedom in healthcare? I mean, is, isn't that why you see things like President Obama's initial insist, uh, hesitation to impose an individual mandate and then all the political trouble that caused. Um, it's, why, it's why you see his, the, why o- Obama had to say over and over again, if you like your plan, you can keep it. People seem attached to the idea of certain kinds of choice in health care, even though they also want guarantees of it. Right. Well, I have three things to say about that. The first is I do think that the idea of choice in health care is in large part about this other element of freedom that we have talked about briefly, which is fear. I actually think what people, when people say they want choice in their healthcare uh, provider, what they really fear is losing their doctor at a time when they are the most vulnerable. So I think that's a very important element in the freedom of choice in the healthcare debate argument. So that's the first thing. Second thing I'll say is that You know, one thing that many, many Democrats, progressives are talking about right now is a very robust public option, meaning that the public, uh, the government would provide some kind of health insurance. And what's interesting to think about there, you can actually think about that kind of public provision of health insurance as a kind of competition policy. In many places, you actually have large, sclerotic, overly bureaucratized health insurance companies um, keeping costs high. You can talk about the pharma industry, et cetera. There's a lot to talk about there. But the question really is whether public options in in health insurance provision can actually help create more competition and drive, talk about markets instead of business per se, which is what you had said about President uh, Trump's uh, orientation here. Anyway, you can think about public provision there as a kind of competition policy. That's the second thing. Third thing I'll say quickly is that, you know, choice doesn't always work out so well when you just look at the data. Um, About 25 years ago, we decided that choice uh, in school vouchers was very, very important. We started a program in school vouchers in Milwaukee. Uh, that, that choice was taken up mostly by um, African-American families. Uh, and actually, 25 years later, what you still see in Milwaukee is some of the worst school outcomes um, in the country. So clearly, choice, kids who have taken up charter schools there, um, has not yielded the kind of outcomes that we would have wanted. 
Uh, Gene, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, policy making around healthcare in the two administrations that, that you served in, um, because choice was such an important part of these political debates. Um, and, and, the, and the President Obama going out and saying, if you like your plan, you can keep it, which was not strictly true, but it was mostly true. And the plan was, de and, and the plan was designed in a way that sort of bent over backwards to allow people to keep plans that, to Felicia's point, maybe were not that well designed and maybe you wouldn't have allowed them if you were designing a system from scratch. How did the, the need to honor people's desire to make certain choices sort of enter into the overall calculus of, of making healthcare policy? Well, I, I think it was a 15-year uh, uh, evolution that came a bit from the failure of the Clinton health care plan, which a lot of people don't remember that the Clinton health care plan was actually more government-oriented and more pushing people into what we called HIPICs, health insurance purchasing cooperatives, I believe, and that people, I think, started to work and wonder people, Tom Daschle, uh, others started working to say, look, is there a way that you could reach this goal uh, and still uh, more directly give people that option? And, you know, President Obama's option compared to other health care options was probably the most keep your own health care if you wanted it. And I think that is a, you know, I, I think that's an important, that, that's not a lesson that should be completely thrown overboard now. I mean, I, I have great empathy with the single payer folks, they have done a lot in our country to drive the view of healthcare as a right, healthcare for all. And I think compared to today, a world in which everybody had more, you know, health, if this was the only way you could deliver it, I think you could, people could make an argument that the positive freedom for people who had affordable health care and didn't have the fear they were a single paycheck and a single illness away from financial devastation might be better on a freedom perspective. I think where, uh, uh, you know, where I share, I think, Felicia's view a bit is that I'm not as sure that you can't reach that goal in ways that uh, honor the positive freedoms <coughs> that people should have of ensuring affordable health care for all without still giving Americans that sense of choice that if they are happy with their employer provided health care they could keep it so uh, I do believe that a the kind of robust public option where everybody no matter who you are can be assured that you can have health care it is essentially a right but you still have some choice to make your own decisions if you like your health care uh, may be a more practical way to reach the goal of health care for all, and it may be more consistent with both of this, uh, these, d these varying views of freedom and choice that are also values that, Amer th that you have to honor together with the importance of health security. But j just to be clear, though, Bernie Sanders' plan, which a number of Democratic presidential candidates are on, is not a competition plan, it's not a choice plan, it's not a freedom plan, it is a coercion plan that will take your private health insurance away from you and prevent you from ever again buying private health insurance. Now, choice in education, there's a lot of debate about the research about how uh, choice programs have affected uh, public schools and, and the quality of public schools. But you look at places in New like New York City, when they want to limit charter schools, who's marching against this? Who is in favor of choice? It is these African-American parents who desperately wanted more choice and are denied it unless there are charter schools. Um, so, so people generally, they want more choice rather than less, and defining, denying them choices as freedom, again, it's an Orwellian perversion of the word. You can call those sorts of other things, but please don't call it what it isn't. Just quickly, I think African-American students, families want better education. Unfortunately, choice has not really delivered that for them. I don't think anybody would claim that uh, many of the large public systems that are currently very segregated uh, because there aren't desegregation programs 
deliver strong educational outcomes either. But I, I don't think that this is a matter of African American families wanting choice for its own sake. Is, isn't but, it possible there's no first principle here? I mean, my, my sense is that, you know, that charter performance varies geographically, that it's relatively good in New York, and maybe one of the reasons that you're seeing that organization organizing in New York is that the charter system there has actually worked well for a lot of families, and then there are other places in the country where choice has not worked out so well. So maybe, you know, maybe this isn't, a, maybe this question actually isn't one about freedom. Maybe it's, as, as Ken's saying, it's a question about how to, how to best deliver services, and that might vary depending on the circumstance. Yeah, I'm only trying to say that it's, yeah. it's not a choice. I was only reacting to Rich's point that yeah. African-American families want choice, think they want better education, and, and there, there are a variety of ways to do that. Um, desegregation, explicit desegregation is certainly one of them. But, and why, but and one of the reasons they, they have better education in New York is because they g can go to the Harlem Success Academy because they have that choice because the public school monopoly has been at least to some significant extent breached. And that, that greater choice is freedom. Denying that choice to them is not freedom. And, and what the problem exists in the first place because we're trying to basically break a government monopoly, as Rich has said. And, that, and, and the, what, what's really classic about this country is you, we have to pay as taxpayers substantial amounts of money for this classic underperformance. You just go sector by sector. You can't get this underperformance for free. You've got to really overpay for it. And so the, 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 the thought, there's one other thing missing in the healthcare the conversation, and that is competition breeds also innovation. Markets are not perfect. But I would also argue we don't have a market for health care. We have a third-party system where the customer is not paying necessarily what, for the goods and services that are being delivered. So we've already, now we're just debating on how to fix a system that's already bastardized and make it better. Let's try to make it better, which I totally agree with. But we do have a system where there's basic innovation. People from all over the world come to the United States for the advancements and the innovation, the technology that is being applied to our health care system. And, some, and meant much of that is, is emanates from a market-based uh, foundation. So I, I really want to avoid the conversation if, if when we're talking about freedom, Josh, you're doing a good job of moderating, but I'm going to try to get us <laughs> talking about freedom. And that is this paternalistic idea that if you don't like the outcome, let's turn over the process to a greater authority who will give us a better outcome that we can desire. While that may be true in the short term, I fear the growth in the bureaucracy only goes one way. And I don't want to turn that over, basically, because we're unhappy with the outcome. Let's, let's, let's fi try to fix, the, fix the, the ingredients that got us to where we are. But we've got to be careful. We've got to be careful of being so paternalistic and saying that the ends justify the means. But so actually, you, you sound like you're talking about Facebook. Sorry. <laughs> so you're talking about large companies. The, but so I, 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 it seems to me a little bit like you're assuming your conclusion there. I, I, so when, when you talk about that, you know, the... the the, the reason that healthcare is so expensive is because of the, the, the lack of, co of competition and choice. When you look like in the, in the Rand Health Insurance study, what happens when you raise people's deductibles and give them more responsibility to make those decisions by themselves? They do in fact consume less healthcare, but they're not good at figuring out which healthcare they should stop consuming. They stop consuming both healthcare that would have been wasteful and healthcare that would have actually improved their health outcomes. So I guess that you know, there are certain goods for which you know, a market is you know, market's great for furniture and you know, people buy the right couches for their house and you don't need the government to come in and tell people what to buy. But there can be markets that either because we've decided socially that we have to, to ensure a minimum standard and then you end up with moral hazard necessarily because of that, or because consumers are just poorly positioned to evaluate what they're buying, we, we where the market might not lead you to a good outcome. Fair enough. We have, a, we have, we have 100 years of, of miseducating consumers. Talk about moral hazard. That's what our healthcare system is. So now when you give them the right, and they haven't, and the, and the consumer, us as consumers, we haven't been taught on how yet. So we'll work that out. I think that over the long run, we absolutely will. And President Bush, back in his day, HSAs were a big part of what he implemented because choice and competition were kind of big pillars. And, and to me, I think if, if, we just don't, if we just don't forget that there are benefits to that, and then let's focus on how to refine it um, instead of throwing it out. I actually, I want to turn and talk about a, a completely different policy area where I think we can have an, sort of an instructive uh, fight between two different types of freedoms that the government might have an interest in. And this has to do with non-discrimination law, where you have businesses th th that, you, that either employ people or house people or provide services to people, um, and you have governments come in and they impose laws that say you cannot discriminate on the basis of race or religion or sexual orientation. And that's to, that's to honor a positive right for people to be, to be in the marketplace and to be treated fairly along certain respects. 
then you have certain merchants who wish to assert a negative right. They say, you know, I, you know, my, my ideological beliefs, my religious beliefs require me to not participate in this transaction, in this event, to ser not serve this customer, that sort of thing. And so government ha has to, it, seem, it seems to me, make some sort of balancing choice there about which of those freedoms to honor or how to honor them. So I guess, first of all, does, it, does anyone want to take the position that one of those interests just is not actually a freedom interest and there's nothing for the government to consider there? It's obvious to land on one side of that or the other. Well, I, uh, I think we should recognize, as I said, that, that when you are looking at freedom, you mm -hmm. are in times making balancing choices. Um, I think that, going to a point Felicia said earlier, I think people are often more focused on the end result. So you take education, as you've been talking mm -hmm. about before. I think most people think their child having a good education is essential to the free, their freedom to participate in the market, to live a good life, to have economic security. And as you said, some of these debates we're having are not first order which people maybe should be open-minded to uh, whichever result, uh, whichever process or combination results in that, be in that best choice, of which there are mixed results, as Rich and Felicia argued about. When you're looking at discrimination, et cetera, uh, you are making some uh, uh, balancing acts. And I think there's times we've made those balancing acts. I think our country was founded on a certain degree of that balance that we believe in a fundamental notion of people being able to pursue their liberties, their rights, and that the arc of justice, the arc of satisfying that has tended to take away those barriers, not just from the public sector, though progressives and conservatives are starting to realize some of the barriers for people leaving prison that are put on to keep them from living their lives. But I think that we've made a decision that I think is most consistent with our vision of freedom, that another person's freedom to discriminate against you, to keep you from pursuing your living where you want, to having the job you want, uh, is a lesser freedom. We are choosing the freedom of people to uh, uh, be able to pursue jobs, to live where they want, pursue their dreams regardless of their gender, their sexual identity, their, uh, their religion, and, uh, uh, or their race. And perhaps it is true that our constitutional provisions were based on government limitations, but there was a broader value that has come out and expressed in our civil rights laws where we are choosing to honor the freedom of people to pursue their lives over the freedom of people who may have reasons uh, for their personal bias or even out of their religion to discriminate and, prevent and, and deny other people that opportunity. Rich, it seems to me like, like conservatives have bought into that framework. Now, not necessarily, uh, there are obviously debates about you know, which kinds of protections and in which environment and, and extents, but it seems to me that this is a positive liberty that conservatives have embraced. I mean, in particular, they are concerned about protections uh, for religious people against discrimination, not just from the government, but from private employers and other private actors. And it seems to me, again, that this is, you know, th this is an area where the left and the right agree that there is a positive liberty here that merits certain kinds of protections, and it's just a, it's just a matter of, of, of extent. Well, I don't think the right to conscience is a... a a positive liberty. I, th I think it's a, it, it's a right, and uh, that, that's part of the basket of negative freedoms, but this goes to the point I was making at the very beginning. I mean, government does have a, a role in protecting our rights. In fact, I mean, you can read in the, in the Declaration of Independence, the reason that our government was instituted by the founders fundamentally was to protect our rights. So if government is protecting your right, it doesn't change that right into a positive uh, freedom, but I, I think there's a, a role for anti-discrimination laws. Uh, obviously, the, the so there's some libertarians who, who don't think Rand Paul's argued this at times that the Civil Rights Act was necessary because discrimination would have dis dissolved over time, and maybe it would have. But th that system in the South was buttressed by a culture that was very uh, long-lasting and by government rules that were perverse and wrong and unconstitutional. So there was a, rule, there was a role for government in vindicating uh, those rights. Now, it's just their tensions. And um, 
the, the issue around conscience and anti-discrimination is, is one of those tensions. But the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which has been so controversial in recent years, it just changes the balance on how government considers these questions and says there has to be compelling interest if a government interest that can't be uh, achieved in any other way if you're actually going to impinge on someone's uh, free exercise of religion or conscience. This is Josh Barrow. We're going to take a quick break. Coming up, more of my conversation about economic freedom with Rich Lowry, Kenneth Hirsch, Gene Sperling, and Felicia Wong, recorded live at the Milken Institute Global Conference. You're listening to Left, Right, and Center. People talk about how a record can save your life, but some records go further. They can teach you how to survive. I love you for the greatest, Sean. I love that it is an unholy album made with holy methods. Poet Hanif Abdurraqib on Cat Power's The Greatest. I'm Jessica Hopper, and I'm your host for season two of Lost Notes. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Let's, let's look to the future. I want to talk about how candidates are talking about freedom in this election and how, they, how, how political actors might talk about it in the future. Uh, Felicia, can you talk about you know, the way Democrats are talking about freedom now and anyone in the field who you think is doing an especially good job of it? Right. Well, I think they have a couple people who are really uh, taking this freedom um, argument to a new level in the current presidential debate. The first and most obvious is Mayor Pete Buttigieg from South Bend, Indiana, who went viral, I don't know, maybe about a month ago, six weeks ago, uh, when he gave a speech at a town hall saying, you know, I care about freedom, and I also believe that government is not the only thing that makes me unfree. Very large companies can make me unfree. Racism can make people unfree. And this was a very plain-spoken way of making an argument both about the importance of freedom as a quintessential American value, but also pointing to a range of ways in which people are unfree. And I think it really helped propel him into a different status in the presidential race. So that's one person. The other person I think is really interesting on the freedom point is uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren. Now, some of you might... uh, Smile. Why are you looking at me? (laughs) I wasn't rolling my eyes. She's made a really interesting point about the ways in which um, a very cronyist, corrupt government, whether in the United States or abroad, you know, her her foreign policy argument is really about a kind of anti-authoritarianism. Americans, America should be a beacon of freedom, she argues. That's why government ought not be corrupt, and we certainly should be worried about the kinds of authoritarian governments that. Uh, some of my co-panelists are also worried about, and that's why we have to look at a a public service, public interest government that is part of what keeps us free. Um, And she's made that argument very robustly. And to me, when she makes that argument, she again sounds like the Freedom House guys from, you know, like the mid-1950s or early 1960s. So it's a very interesting way in which I think Democrats have taken a broad and entirely morally defensible um, pro-freedom argument in this campaign. Gene, I'm, I'm interested in what Felicia says there about Senator Warren because I, I, I'm struck that Senator Warren's agenda is in many ways aligned with Senator Bernie Sanders' policy agenda, but they have very different ways of talking about it. And Warren's framing is very sen- places freedom at the center, and also she's very insistent, you know, I am a capitalist, I'm not a socialist, I want... The, I want markets that work for people, whereas Sanders takes similar ideas and goes out and says, no, I'm a socialist, and I think does not place freedom as central in his message. Is that important for the party? Which, which of those approaches is taken if the party is going to move left on some of these economic issues? Does it need to talk about that as a freedom agenda? Uh, I, I do think that the message Elizabeth Warren is giving is uh, a stronger one for those reasons. I think that she is making the point that she is trying to correct capitalism, you know, take her signature program that we're proud of in the Obama administration too, the uh, uh, CFPB, the, the, cons- pr- the agency that protects consumer rights. You know, some people would say, well, that's about kind of intervening in the market. That's like limiting the freedom. But I think that what she dedicated her life to a lot was that for a lot of people, they are exploited, They are victims of predatory behavior. And that by setting it so that markets are competing on the high road, you're not limiting 
uh, uh, markets. You're making markets uh, uh, compete in ways that are consistent with people's dignity, consistent with people's freedom. And I, I think that is, a, 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 you know, I think that is a strong message. Now, you know, she's obviously very, very, you know, they're both very, very tough on major companies. She's very tough on major banks, but she also will stress that the ultimate goal is to make those work for credit, for small businesses, for companies. So I think, uh, uh, you know, I, I think for myself, I find that a more compelling message that uh, um, makes a lot of the same points, but as you says, also say also is more in line with correcting our current system, keeping what it is, uh, uh, what many people may honor ideally, but trying to uh, indeed make that work. The, the last thing I just say though is, because I think it's important to be said here, is that I think one of the other powerful things that's happening on freedom is that you're seeing more, particularly of African American voices in politics, talking about what freedom means. And what's interesting there is that that's not just a call for the affirmative freedoms of government, though it certainly is, but also the negative protections against police brutality, against a discriminatory criminal justice system, against lack of safety in neighborhoods. And so, again, goes to my original point, which is if you want to make freedom real in people's lives, you have to go to where they are and how they experience their freedom. And I think that the, <laughs> the advent of uh, police cameras and iPhones, et cetera, have made it a lot clearer to the rest of America how unfree a lot of people in minority communities are, not just because there's not the health care or the quality education, though that's critical, but also because they are experiencing discrimination and need more protection and fairness from our criminal justice system uh, uh, to, to live lives that are free in fact, not just in theory. Ken, does the right have a ready response to, to the left's case that, 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 this, that this agenda they've laid out is a freedom agenda? I mean, I think certainly the word socialism has lost a lot of the sting that it had once, ha once had for conservatives. Yeah, I think we have a generation that doesn't necessarily associate socialism with our freedom. Yeah, I think there's a lot of free uh, in that agenda, um, the first four <laughs> letters in per particular. Um, the, uh, everything Gene just outlined, I think, again, comes to making the, making the world a better place. And I would go back to the question on discrimination, because I think that has more to do with liberty, to Felicia's point, than, than this broad, expansive definition of freedom. And life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, basic anti-discrimination is an essential part of that. And so I would put that in that category. I think uh, wrapping ourselves in the flag of, of freedom, if you will, to include basically a, a, an argument that says, we, if we can provide anything, um, then let's go ahead and do it, um, is, to me, I just, it's just, it's just difficult. But it's not, a, it's, to me, but it, it's, the wrong, it's the wrong place to put all of the things that Gene was just talking about. We have, we have significant problems in the criminal justice system. We have significant problems in, in safety on our streets. Let's talk about that. Because that, to me, is, is, those, is those delivering of good, basic goods and services of a developed economy on how we as citizens can do what we want to do more openly and safely and carefully, et cetera. And I think that if it, it, when it gets cast as this left versus right, it just pollutes the whole argument and it causes people to go to their corners and, and shut down, shuts down discussion. And that's the shame of it all, in my opinion. Rich, it seems to me that part of the shift that we've seen from Donald Trump in, in the way he talks about freedom has to do with a, a sense that Republicans were not going to win this argument on a lot of these freedom issues laying out what they have said previously. Um, Donald Trump, in, in a lot of ways, ran to the left of Mitt Romney when he ran for president and said, you know, I'm not going to touch Social Security or Medicare or Medicaid. When he talks about wanting to repeal the Affordable Care Act, he talks vaguely about, you know, we're going to have, you know, health care for everyone much better and much cheaper. It seems that, that his, his view, and I, I don't think that it was necessarily a wrong, wrong view as a matter of political analysis, was that, you, that the public does endorse this idea that the, that the government should provide a fairly expansive suite of benefits, and, and maybe even that, that is part of freedom. Yeah, so I, I would say a couple things. One, I think still, like if you woke up in the middle of like 3 a.m., the average Republican shook him awake and said, you know, what, what do you stand for? He or she would say freedom. But that's not <laughs> what Donald Trump says unless it's in, in the teleprompter, as you said earlier um, in the session, strength, 
greatness, winning, hiring the best people. Yeah. <laughs> these these are, the, are, are things closer to his core. And I think he did get at a problem with the Republican agenda. One, uh, there was a tendency among some Republicans just to think, just saying the word freedom was a substitute to having a well-articulated uh, and thought out and detailed policy agenda. And, um, and, and two, freedom for a lot of people, it's an, it's an abstraction. And then three, I think this is what really Trump gets to. If you take the proverbial you know, 50-year-old factory worker from a Midwestern town who's lost his job he's had for 20 years, and he's told implicitly or maybe explicitly, hey, look, uh, no problem, you're free to move to North Dakota, you know, where unemployment is 2% and all the fracking jobs are. That's not going to be very uh, appealing to him. And so, so Trump's put more of an emphasis on um, security. You see it especially in trade, immigration, and entitlements. Now, I think the most thoughtful and forward-looking conservative policy analysts were kind of focused on this problem um, and were thinking through ways to address them uh, thoughtfully in ways that wouldn't uh, increase the, the coercive powers, the extent of government, but um, they, they're minority voices now, and, and Trump, just through his, his sheer force of personality, is, is his approach and his rhetoric are dominant. Well, arguably, the last big Republican policy initiative that we saw that went through Rich's framework like that was, was Medicare Part D, the expansion of, of Medicare in the George W. Bush administration, which it seems to me, you know, President Bush faced resistance from people on the right in the party who, whose view was, we shouldn't expand entitlements at all. This is not what government is for. And he was try saying, you know, no, this is, you know, th this, uh, this is a core value that we provide health care to seniors and pre prescription drugs are part of that. And I think tried to find a way to, to, to honor markets in the process of doing that. Was, was that successful? Well, that's, you know, the, the sausage, ma I'll leave the historians to write about the sausage making of the legislative process. President Bush was clear in his articulation that competition and choice, um, including HSAs, were things that we were trying to, that he was trying to make sure were embodied. Um, and uh, and that, that, he didn't want to leave those core concepts. In the process of legislation, uh, you know, things happen, and I think that that's, that the history will bear that out, that, that they did preserve, they did preserve choice, um, they did preserve competition, and as a result, over a 15-year period, the, the trajectory of that budget was a lot less than it, than it could have been. I want to make one other point about, about um, it's really easy today to say we have these issues and therefore we're not really free because of, of health care costs or the transportability benefits, et cetera. But if you rolled forward, if we said, all right, let's, let's give it all. Let's just give it all. Take the federal debt from $22 trillion, Take it to $40 trillion. What the heck? Okay, and on the back side of that, we have massive inflation. We return to the massive inflation we ha might have had 30 years ago or 40 years ago. Um, at that point, inflation is the equivalent of theft, okay? And so I can easily make the case that, that moderate conserv and moderately conservative fiscal and monetary policy to hold, to hold that inflation in check is, in a sense, one of the pillars of preserving freedom. If we throw that out, be careful what you wish for on the other side because then people are going to be screaming essentially how... It got taken from them, but it got taken by, by massive inflation. So I, I just think it's a very, very drawn out question. We've got to be really, really careful about, about lumping freedom with today's social issues that we really need to tackle. Did, uh, uh, Gene, Felicia, d does that concern you that when people hear, you know, free college, free health care, they're going to think, well, I'm, you know, it's not free. I'm paying for that through my taxes, and that's making me less free. No, I think the sort of overall macroeconomic conditions are such that Inflation is not something that we need to be deeply worried about. And actually, you could make a strong argument for, for many of these investments in the American future to actually use some combination of debt financing and increased taxes. I'm sure we disagree with that on this panel, but there's a very strong uh, set ro and robust set of arguments in favor of that. Uh, but the other thing I wanted to say, coming back to your question about President Trump, is that if I were a classic, classic conservative right now, I would feel really pinned. Because I would feel that on the one hand, um, <laughs> you know, uh, a bunch of Democratic candidates are making a pretty credible argument that this range of freedoms is uh, all-American, pretty popular, um, a, a, a something like 60 or 70 percent of Americans actually want government to do more to help solve these problems, and government uh, and uh, uh, Democrats are, are 
talking about this in this broad freedom mantle, and that seems to be working for some of them on the one hand. On the other hand, the standard bearer of my party really does sound like an authoritarian. You know, at his own convention, he says, I am your voice. He talks regularly about a kind of, you know, press as the enemy of the people in ways that I think, uh, I don't want to speak for my fellow panelists, but I would expect make many people across the political spectrum incredibly anxious. So I'm in this position, if I'm a classic conservative, where I'm really not sure what to do, even with my own definition of what freedom means in American politics. We're, we're almost done, but I, I want to get Rich's reaction to that, which, like, do you worry about President Trump as, as, a, threat, as a threat to freedom? Does that counteract some of these concerns about, you know, how we pay for health care? No, I'd say two things. One, if there are any Republicans that are kind of on, on the fence about Trump, um, Democrats are making it really easy because uh, the party is lurching to the left. It's not a freedom agenda. It's, it's a, a coercion agenda, mass, you know, uh, mass clothed in the rhetoric of freedom, not very convincingly. But look, Trump, uh, he tramples our norms in ways that I think are, are very... Uh, uh, disturbing. He shouldn't call the, the media the enemies of people and all that, but that's not, that's not crimping press freedom. And I think the most disturbing thing he's done is assert the right to unilaterally spend money in effect by declaring a national emergency at the border. I think that's wrong. I, I think uh, everyone should fight it. But Obama did worse, I think with less statutory warrant when he basically rewrote immigration law on his own to uh, uh, give us a version of the DREAM Act when Congress wouldn't. So unfortunately, an overweening executive in view of presidential power is not something that is unique to President Trump, and I think is a problem in our system that, that uh, has to be pushed back against by both parties, against presidents of both parties. That was a special Left, Right, and Center episode recorded live at the Milken Institute Global Conference. Thanks to Rich Lowry, Kenneth Hirsch, Felicia Wong, and Gene Sperling. Special thanks to the Milken Institute for inviting Left, Right, and Center to be part of the Global Conference. And thanks to Conrad Kiechel and Paul von Zielbauer. Left, Right, and Center is produced by Sarah Fay. Our technical director is J.C. Swadek. Todd M. Simon composed our theme music. I'm Josh Barrow. Thanks for joining us. And tune in Friday for more Left, Right, and Center. Download and subscribe at kcrw.com slash LRC, the KCRW app, or wherever you find podcasts. Left, Right, and Center is produced and distributed by KCRW.